Father, we're grateful that Christ paid for our sins and defeated death, that we might share in that through faith, through faith in his person and work. And so those of us who've done that, Father, we now know that you deal with our sins, not as the judge. We've already come through the courtroom. We've been declared not guilty and declared righteous in the courtroom of heaven. We're in Christ and will be. We're adopted into the family of God. We will be forever. Nothing can change that. But we continue with the same beliefs we had and the same patterns and, and habits, and much of that is not acceptable to you. And when we commit these sins, we're to confess it and just be honest with you about it. So we come to do that so that the Spirit might be the teacher tonight. And we pray that he will reveal these things to us in Christ's name. Amen. Last night we talked about conditional love, romantic love, and how romantic love and friendship love are both conditional. Can't be friends with somebody that doesn't return your friendship. I mean, you can express friendship or express romance. I mean, if you've ever had an unrequited love or expressed romance to someone that wasn't interested in you, it didn't go very far, you know, only in your mind. But the point is that these types of love, what we call love, and this is, the Bible uses three out of these four. The, the fours come from the Greeks, and the, the three, two of those, uh, eros and phileo, are conditional. They require a return. But storge, which is family love, love for your children, for your brother, your sister, is pretty much unconditional. Now, it can break down under extreme duress. Unconditional love, agape, is the highest form of love, and it is truly a committed uh, uh, mindset to edify. And so we're going to just develop that some more tonight. Uh, con the conditional loves, as we just said, romance and friendship require a return from the other person. Unconditional loves, family love, storge, and agape do not. All Bible words, and listen, all four of these words started out in the before they were in the Bible, they started out as just normal secular words. The writers didn't create these words. These were words that were in everyday conversation. So they they transmitted the idea of whatever the word means. And we want, what we want to do tonight is try to understand what the word agape or agapao meant before it became a Bible word. Because many people think that agape is just simply Christian love. They just think that's its only meaning. And so we want to understand a little deeper so that we can grasp how it works in our life. Because that, isn't that the real key? How does this work? How do we work it? How does it work in our life? So the secular use gives us the root meaning to help us understand what the writers are saying. The word philos and phileo or agape and agapao are often used interchangeably in the Bible, but they still retain their individual meanings. And we've taught in the past for the sake of simplicity that these words or have these very diverse meanings, but often they're uh, like Matthew prefers the word phileo. Luke prefers the word agape. Do you know what the Septuagint is? Septuagint is the, is the Hebrew, I mean, excuse me, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's performed by 70 different Hebrew scholars. Their use, the word ahav in the Hebrew is the, main, is the primary word for love, and it's translated by agape many, almost every time, just rare exceptions. So the significance of that, I'll get to in a second, but uh, philos is compatibility love, affection, admiration. It includes enjoyment. It has to include enjoyment or you won't do it. 
I mean, you're not going to be friends with somebody that you don't enjoy, that you don't like, that does that offers nothing in in the relationship. That's what friendship is. It's a mutual reciprocal enjoyment of each other. And I met a man today who's a counselor that works at Bethel Baptist. He's a delightful fellow. I really enjoyed. We talked for over an hour about counseling strategies and approaches, and I just had a I had a real good time with him. He's uh, he's very similar to me in his thinking and his interest in his age and just a lot of things that were compatible between us. We were the same. So we found a basis for enjoying each other. That was fun. So that's philos. Agape, on the other hand, is a devotion. <clears throat> it's a commitment. It doesn't require that you enjoy the person. You may not even like the person. You may not can hardly stand the person. Yet still, you're determined to edify the person. You're determined to be of service to them. It's hard. It is. And it's, it requires that we let go of self and truly grab hold of the Spirit. It requires that we let go of the idea that we get to indulge ourselves in what we want or don't want and grab the Spirit and hear His voice saying, that person needs the truth. Jackie brought up last night how often unconditional love, which we think of as just getting along, going along to get along, that's not love at all. That's a, that's a strategy of avoiding conflict. Listen, if you can't stand conflict, then you're not yet able to love fully. Okay, you're, you're operating from fear, not love. love. Love confronts when it's beneficial. When the Spirit reveals to you and in your heart you believe that by confronting and saying the truth to this person, speaking the truth in love, that you will help this person, edify this person, then that's the Lord calling on you to do that. And, but, but listen, our, often we're afraid to do that type of thing for fear of disapproval, of losing the relationship, or coming under criticism, hurting the other person. Listen, allowing someone to go on in their error serves them not at all. It doesn't serve their, their needs at all. Now, you say, well, how do I know when? Listen, you've got to learn how to listen to the Spirit because He will tell you you're going to go, oh, no, 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 no. But yes, you've got to, it's your time, it's your turn to bring it out and, and share it and hopefully in a positive way for a positive purpose, looking at a positive outcome. It's not a negative, but that's agape. Agape includes desire and pleasure. Listen, agape is not devoid of these other love experiences. In other words, you may have a, a wonderful experience expressing agape, but it's not necessary. It's not a necessary part like it is with friendship or romance. Now, what I want you to see is that in Genesis 29, 18, will you turn there with me just real quick? And then we're going to go to John 21. But Genesis 29, 18, we looked at it last night <clears throat> very briefly. It says, oh, where does it say that? It says, now Jacob loved Rachel. Okay? Now, do you know the story of Jacob loving Rachel? Jacob was absolutely crazy about Rachel. He, he couldn't think of anything else or anyone else. He made the children they had together his favorites, even though they were very, 
They were the youngest in the family. He made them the head, the priority. He, he put the others to work and left these two in the house so that he could dote on them. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible is describing here. And the word that's used is the word agape. And what I want, to, want you to understand about that is this word agape, in the, in, when translating the Old Testament, included all of what Jacob felt for Rachel. This word can include all of that. Listen, agape is the highest form of love. It's a commitment to do good to others, but it can be a lot of fun. It can be, <laughs> listen, it doesn't mean you're a slave to uh, having to put up with everything in the world from this person. Uh, but often, that's how we think of it, or I do. Uh, this is the love that we're to have for our enemies. Love your enemies. It doesn't mean enjoy your enemy. Go over and have a party with your enemy. It means to be committed to edify this person, to give them the gospel, to pray for them, to pray for their spiritual benefit. That's agape. So, we know that what Jacob thought, felt, and desired with Rachel is better described by Eros. Now, would you, having studied Eros last night and the, the romantic love, would you not think that would be normally what you would see there? How Jacob felt for Rachel was more like a romantic love. But the Bible uses agape. So, it's a very diverse word. It's a very inclusive word. It's a very rich word. Um, now, if you will, go to turn back to the New Testament, Luke eleven forty three. I want to show you how agape is used. And I want to show you that the word has the idea of being committed or devoted to something. Luke eleven forty three. So other than just Christian love, a Christian mindset, this word had a lot of different nuances. It says, woe to you Pharisees, for you love, he uses the word agapao, and it's certainly not Christian love here, you love the chief seats, the front seats in the synagogue, and the respectful greetings that you receive from the common man in the marketplace. The Pharisees loved, were committed, devoted to having these places of prominence. They, they were determined that they were going to have that. That's a love. See the idea of commitment there? I mean, they're willing to do whatever to keep these places of prominence. Because what they love is the, is the uh, admiration of the people. So, again, in chapter 20, verse 46, he says, Jesus says, Beware of the scribes who love agapao to walk around in long robes. They love respectful greetings in the marketplace and the chief seats in places of honor. So what he's trying to tell us is these people in their scale of values in their priority system, having a place of prominence where they get respect from all the other people is very, very important to them. They're going to reject Christ over this. And so that's my word for it is they're committed to this. They're determined that they're going to achieve this in their life. And this is the idea. And finally... Very famous, John 3.16. Who knows what that says? God so loved the world. Keep. That's right. How, how about John 3.19? I know. Let me read it to you. 16, God loved the world. In 19, and it says, This is the judgment that light has come into the world, but men loved darkness. Guess what the word is? Same word for God loved the world. Agapao, God is committed to the world to save us from our sins. 
He was so committed he's willing to sacrifice his own son. He'll do whatever he has to do to accomplish the mission. Men love darkness. Men were committed to their darkness. Their evil, self-centered, self-justifying uh, philosophies of life. That's darkness. They're committed to their own mindset, their own ideas. So let's look at some principles. First, agape, I mean, uh, the word philos generally indicates a pleasurable, compatible, reciprocal relationship. Okay, these are your friends, the people that you enjoy, that you call on the phone and laugh and cut up with. This is philos. Agape, in contrast, generally indicates to be devoted or committed to something or someone. It's the opposite of self-indulgence. It's the opposite of pleasing self. I'm going to do what pleases me so that you might edify others. It indicates a committed, devoted giving of self to someone, to some situation, to the Lord. It's first to the Lord and then to others. It's, a, it's an all-out committed giving of yourself. You know, you're supposed to love the Lord with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. That's the word agape, agapao. That's the idea. You give all of yourself to God. You're committed. We're going to see Peter in a minute. Now, the Pharisees desired and were determined to hold these places of prominence, being willing to do whatever was necessary to connive the respect of the common man. They were, they were willing to do whatever in order to listen it wasn't even real. It was based on something false, and yet it was enough for them. Is that not pitiful? Is that not pitiful that you're willing to, you're willing to live with something less than what's real and call it good enough? Call it good enough. Yep, listen, don't say that you haven't done that. I know. Boy. Now, in Matthew 22, 37, we have the idea of a total commitment, a total devotion to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to give all you have to the Lord. That's the idea of agapao or agape. It's a, it's a committed mindset. And when I say mindset, do you know what that word means? It's an attitude, but I used the word policy last night. A policy is something you do every time under certain circumstances. You know, businesses have policies. Uh, if a customer walks in the door and wants, you know, X, Y, Z, then the policy is it goes to the sales department or something like that. If they come in with a problem, perhaps it goes to the repair department. Those are policies that say, all right, this is, this is what you're supposed to do under these circumstances. Yeah, well, a policy is the guideline, the rule by which things are determined. So when you have a policy of agape that says, here's how I treat people, I only do good, I only try to edify, and I never do harm. If what I'm about to do or say, I think it's going to harm them or take away from them or lessen them, I stop. Everything that comes out of me toward other people is to, be, is to help them, to encourage them, to better them spiritually. Spiritually. That's agape. And that's a mindset. Now, agape for the Lord is the committed mindset of the mature believer that God blesses. Uh, listen to Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
Let me help you with this, Romans 8, 28. Listen, Romans 8, 28 only helps those who are able to see that no matter what God allows in your life, he is using for good. You have to be able to see that, and you have to be able to be committed to him so that when he allows adversity, you don't, you don't break faith with him. You don't react to him. You stay connected with him, believing, understanding that what he's doing is for your good. That can get pretty tough sometimes. That can get pretty tough when you're in a situation that doesn't seem to be getting better and that is not pleasing to your soul, that is, that, that is challenging you at every fiber, and you're thinking, I just want out of this. I just want out. This is not what I got in this for. This is not what I bargained for. But the truth says God has allowed that for good. Agathos is divine good, God's good, good in the sense of what God sees as good. I've used this illustration that at the end of football practice, when in the middle of the summer it's 100 degrees, at the end of two-a-day football practices, everybody's exhausted laying on the ground. The coach would blow the whistle and go, all right, time for wind sprints, 40-yard dashes, and everybody's like, oh, now, that certainly wasn't pleasant. But was it good for us? You betcha. That's Agathos. So when God takes all of your circumstances and situations and works them into something that's Agathos, it means he's using it all for your growth, for your development, for your betterment, for your maturity. And listen, the only way it works, it says is if you, it's for those who love God. What I believe that means is those who've reached that place of maturity where you're committed to God and God's plan and God's program no matter what. No matter what. I'm not going anywhere. This is tough as it gets, God, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm hanging in there with you looking for the good. You got to start looking for it immediately. No. Another verse, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those that love him. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about rewards for those that love him. If it was for every believer, then we might be talking something different. But I believe we're looking at rewards because we're talking about those that love him. You can also see this idea in James 2, 5 and 1 John 4, 21. Now, if you will, if you'll turn to John chapter 21, verse 15, I'm going to show you a contrast between phileo and agapao. John 21, 15. <laughs> In verse, you know the story. Peter has denied the Lord three times. Now the Lord has resurrected and come back and he has revealed himself to them and they're all happy, 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 except Peter. Peter appears, now it's not written in here, but he appears to be very discouraged at his own failure. And this is just part of, of his Peter's journey. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 21, after these things, Jesus showed himself again at the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, and this is the setting. And, he, and they were, a bunch of the disciples were together, and Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. Now, some say Peter has determined that he's going back to the fishing business to make a living. There, I don't know that that's the case. He goes and fishes one night. But, you know, the Lord shows up. They don't catch anything. The Lord shows up and says, pull your nets up and cast them on the other side of the boat. And they're like, right, we've been here all night. 
In fact, I think he says that, doesn't he? Uh, children, do you have any fish? He said, cat in the, they, uh, anyway. Is it five? Anyway, they do it and they cast. You know, you know what's interesting to me? Uh, they pull the net in and they tell you exactly how many. The net was full of fish. They got out and they tell you exactly how many there were. Where is that? Was it, what, 153? Yes. 153 fish. They counted them and they recorded it in the, in the eternal scriptures. <laughs> That's interesting to me. I don't know why they would do that. But, uh, but anyway, he, they come up, you know, Peter jumps in and swims to and they come in, they bring the boat, and Jesus has breakfast ready. You know, they just caught a big catch of fish, but Jesus is providing. He's already got it ready. And he sits down with Peter, and they have this discussion. And he says, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, what do you think the these are? The fish. The fish. Look, they just had, they just made a bunch of money. 153 big, large fish, they just made a bunch of money. And there's dollar signs in their eyes, okay? And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And the word he uses is agapa, agapao. <coughs> Peter, are you committed to me more than you are the fishing business or making money in business? And so... Jesus is asking for co commitment. Peter responds, Lord, you know that I love you. And he uses the word phileo, meaning you know that I'm your friend. You know that I'm your big buddy. This Peter, see, Peter wants this human, reciprocal, enjoyable relationship with Jesus. He wants to be big buddies with Jesus. Jesus is not looking for big buddies. Jesus is looking for agapao, a commitment. And he says, feed my sheep. Yes, Lord, you know that I have this great fondness for you. He says, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. Again, he said to him, Peter, do you agapao me? Are you committed to me? Peter again says, yes, Lord, you know that I have this great love and fondness for you. See the difference? What Jesus is looking for is, an, is a total all-out giving of self. <clears throat> what Peter's... And listen... It appears that Peter is afraid to say, yes, you know that I'm committed to you because of what he just went through. The failure, the three denials and the weeping bitterly and the way that it just broke his own heart that he had let the Lord down. But you can see that when the Lord told him what was going to happen that night, that in, if he had been committed, he would have listened, he would have been willing to surrender and submit himself Instead, he says, I've got this human love for the Lord and I'm going to be a loyal friend. So there's the difference in the two. So Peter, are you committed to me? Lord, you know that I'm your friend. Are you committed to me? You, Lord, you know that I want to be your reciprocal friend. And finally, Jesus comes down to his level and said, Peter, do you are, are we... Are we really friends? Really, are you really my friend? And that's when it says, and uh, where does it say? The third time he said, and Peter was grieved. Peter was grieved. The reason he was grieved is the way the Lord said it. Okay, uh, are, you, are you really my friend? I can't get commitment from you, but and you tell me that we're friends, you want to be my friend. Are you really my friend? Peter's like, Whew. I mean, the Lord, talking about loving confrontation, there's your point. Loving confrontation. I mean, the Lord didn't come and just get along and go along. 
he came and confronted Peter with the reality of what's going on in his soul. And of course, Peter is discouraged, and Peter has lost confidence in himself. He has lost his eye, this image of himself as being able to commit to the Lord and do the job, to tend the sheep. He doesn't think he's worthy of it. That he says, he tells himself, if I if I take the job, I'm gonna I'm gonna fail like I did last time. So he's afraid, and so he won't go out on the limb and give himself to the Lord. Now, Jesus was looking for a commitment from Peter not a personal friendship. Commitment. He wants everything. Now, does the Lord want friendship? Of course he does. On his own terms. On, on the Lord's terms, not my terms. This is something, if you, grow, if you grow into an intimate relationship with the Lord, this is something that you learn because you ask the Lord to reveal himself to you in a more and more real way. And there are times when he just says nothing. Nothing. At times when you're grieving or you're in heartache or you're in sorrow and you say, Lord, fill me up so that it re releases me from this sorrow. And he says, no, nope. the sorrow serves a purpose. Yep. Linda, you agree with that? That's what he does, doesn't he? You betcha. Now, it appears that Peter having failed so dramatically, was afraid to say that he was committed. And But look, he is. He's just having a tough time. Peter's committed. Look, Peter was committed all the way through. No doubt about it. He just needed to be encouraged. He needed to be confronted, cajoled. Perhaps it was Peter's idea of love for Jesus, the phileo, that set him up to fail in the first place. He was determined and wanted to be a loyal friend to do what loyal friends do for one another. Listen, he was willing to pull the sword and fight and die for the Lord as a loyal friend. The only problem with that is it wasn't God's will for Peter to fight and die that night. He was ready to die. It wasn't God's will for him to die. The Lord said, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. He's like, no way. And what's interesting is that it said all, all the other disciples said the same. What did they do when the pressure came? They, <laughs> all of them were trying in human effort and energy to be loyal friends to the Lord. But listen, that's not what the Lord wants. That's called human good. What the Lord wants is what the Spirit produces within us, this total commitment where we give ourselves to the Lord. We give all our possessions, all of this, all of that. We give it all to him. It's his. It's his. So Jesus, I mean, Peter's idea of love for the Lord had was, was such an immature uh, stage that he's still operating out of a human system of normal loyalty for friends. So Peter was trying to love the Lord as a man being loyal to his man friend, not yet understanding that Jesus was God in the flesh. Listen, you don't tell God in the flesh, you know, <laughs> well, I guess Peter does. Hey, I want to be your friend. You know, well, can we be friends? Can we be buddies? Of course, he's been with the Lord on the earth, and that's a different mindset. Agape for Jesus would have been willing to listen and obey the Lord rather than contradict him about the denials and God's will for Peter that night. It wasn't his will for him to die. So what Peter needed in his life at that moment was spirit-led agape based on accumulated truth, having built up and developed the inner strength to be able to remain committed to the Lord no matter what. But what he had was a human, strength, human love, 
It was a human loyalty, and it crumbled under the pressure. Pressure came, and it crumbled for all of them. So let's talk about agape. And what is Christian love? What is agape love? First of all, Christian agape love is the overflow of the believer's soul who is being experientially filled by the Spirit. If you'll turn from John 21 to John chapter 7, I'll show you what Jesus said about this very thing. John 7, 37. I mean, how do, where does agape come from? How is it formed and developed? As a baby believer, you're capable of it because it's the product of the, of the Holy Spirit. But the strength of it comes as we mature. The ability to hang in there and be committed no matter what has to develop. In John 7, 37, Jesus said... The last day of the great feast, he said, if any man is thirsty, and this is a spiritual thirst. You know, he talked about having a hunger and thirst for righteousness. If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me and believe. Eating and drinking are in indications of believing, just like at the Eucharist. Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers, plural, of living water. Now this word innermost being is the word koilos, and it indicates a hole, an empty place. It's most often translated womb. It's used in the New Testament a number of times about an empty place within a woman. It's her womb. Okay, so it's an empty place within us. And it's the, it's the what Blaise Pascal called the God-shaped hole in the center of man. There's a hole in the center of man that only God can fill. And out of that empty place comes this hunger and thirst for relationship, for love, for approval, to be part of something, for inclusion, to accomplish things. These, the needs and desires that every human being has. And these desires that we all have to be part of a love relationship, to be part of an intimacy with, see, with some, someone, to be part of something bigger than ourself, all comes out of this empty place. That's its purpose, is to produce these desires and what it shows Listen, how do you know that you have a need? What does a need feel like? Well, it feels like a desire. It's a hunger. It's a desire. When you have a desire for something, it indicates there's a need for something. Now, it may be a legitimate need. It may not be. Often it's not. Or often we attach our legitimate needs to false objects in life. But still, there's the need. And as I've said many times, you see it in kids. They have this hunger for approval, for attention, for affection. All of them do. And that's because God put that in there. Now, what happens when God begins to fill this empty place as you grow spiritually? Now, he first of all, he starts filling it when you're saved. You come to the Lord and drink the gospel, and you're saved. And Romans chapter 5 says the Spirit pours out the love of God. I'll show you that in a minute. But what happens, do you remember David in Psalm 23 when he says, My cup runneth over? That's the idea. Inside the soul is this empty place. It's like a cup. And as the, as the Lord pours his love into that cup and fills it and fills it and fills it, finally it begins to overflow. And this overflow is ministry to others. 
It's very difficult to give to others in when you're still empty in within yourself. It's difficult. I mean, and it's often not real. It's not the same thing as this overflow of living water. So agape is the overflow. It's the overflow. I mean, when you have what you need and you know that you have what you need and you are experiencing a relationship with God knowing you have what you need and that nothing's going to interfere with that or take that away from you, it, you're able to start giving away all of what God gives you without fear of not having enough. He, you're over, it, oh, it's overflowing in your life. And that's a good thing. Now, Romans 5, 5. Oh, if you want to turn, you can. I'll read that. It's pretty important because... <clears throat> He says in verse 5, Romans 5, 5, and, and, well, let's go to verse 3. He's talking about our, our hope in the glory of God in the eternal state. And not only this, we also rejoice in our adversities, knowing that adversity brings about endurance or perseverance, the ability to stand fast. And endurance brings about proven character. It develops your character within. And proven character develops hope. Hope is confidence in the future. And confidence in the future does not ever disappoint us like the normal things of life do because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts into this empty place through the Holy Spirit given to us at salvation. What's interesting is the word poured out is in the perfect tense. That, what that means is all of the love of God has been poured out totally and completely. Boom. There's no more love to get. You already have all of God's love. Okay? You already have it all. It's that we don't experience it. It's amazing to me how many years I spent knowing, believing that God loved me, but not feeling that, having no experience of that. In re I mean, just being real. And you can tell yourself, oh, yeah, I know. But when I finally understood that all of the mistakes and failures of my life were not powerful enough to make me unworthy for go of God's love, and that who I was in Christ had trumped everything. And that in Christ, God's love had been poured out, and I was full of it. it. I began to feel it. I began to know and realize it was real to me. There's a great difference in your life when, the, when God's love is real to you and when it's not. And I hope, you, I hope you've had that experience. Uh, chapter 5, 3 and 4, we read, The pressures of adversity develop the inner man, character, confidence in God's love. And this is where we realize that his love has already been given to us fully. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, talks about how adversity cre produces growth in our life, leading to maturity and creating this overflow. And finally, in 1 John 4, 18, the Bible says, John says, mature love, it's translated perfect love, it's really mature love, rejects fear in relation to God because there's no reason to be afraid of God. I took Chafin to uh, his first radiation thing this morning, and uh, it was really a consultation. He didn't get it, but there was a guy in there. This guy was talking to everybody. He was like... Mr. Extrovert, I mean, he came over and was up and, and uh, so I got to talking with him. He said, oh, yeah, my wife's an evangelist. And I went, well, okay. And uh, he said, yeah, we're Pentecostal. And I'm like, well, I couldn't tell that. And uh, anyway, uh, gosh, what was I telling you about? Anyway, uh, 
he was talking about, I said, yeah, I know y'all don't believe in eternal security, you know? And uh, he said, no. I said, you know, I don't see how you live your whole life in fear, you know, that God's going to get rid of you. And he said, no, it's not fear, it's just caution. We live in caution. <laughs> and I went, dude, you know, I mean, this guy was a character. He really was. But, uh, you know, I said, and I quoted this, mature love eliminates fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. You've already been passed through the courtroom of heaven, been pronounced not guilty, given the righteousness of God, adopted into the family of God. You're secure forever, period, over and out. Nothing can happen to make you lose that. And he's like, so I could see his little wheels turning. Who knows? It's, listen, when you get that in your mind, though, it's very hard to get rid of it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't this morning. He, he took off after that. He'd about had enough. Yeah, he came to a he came to a gunfight with a butter knife. Uh, secondly, baby believers are capable of agape love, but it's inconsistent and easily overwhelmed by our self-interest and temptation to react sinfully. In James four one through four, we see the concept of hedonism, which is commitment to pleasure. And, and, and sensual self-indulgence. It's a me-centered way of thinking. And as a baby believer, you, you carry your belief system from the world with you into the Christian life, which is all about me, me, me. And so initially in the Christian life, you don't have the strength because you are constantly reacting and going back to your self-interest. Uh, Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says the sin nature takes your desire system, corrupts it, and attaches it by faith to wrong objects. In other words, desire is just desire. Desire is not good or bad. It de desire is dependent on what you attach it to. So you think, well, I've got sinful desires. What you have is desire attached to sinful desires ideas or objects. You've attached your desire to a inappropriate, ungodly way of meeting the desire. That's what you got. And you build a habit out of that. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2 talks about laying aside malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, sins of the tongue, and desire, which is a command, the pure milk of the word. This passage doesn't teach you that if you are a baby, you will desire the word. It doesn't say that. It commands you to desire it. In other words, it commands you to put yourself in a position to hear it, to understand it, and believe it, whether you feel like it or not. And I encourage you to do that because if you will, you'll find yourself starting to want it. It'll be like priming the pump where all of a sudden the things begins to flow and you begin to have this system working through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and it gets going and you build momentum with it and the next thing you know, you do want it and you do, care, you do desire it. As a believer matures, deletes the beliefs that cause fear, accepts the truth about God's love, we're able to open the heart to the Lord, allowing his love to heal wounds and build a mindset of love to others. In my opinion, as a counselor, as, a, as that kind of niche person, it's difficult for all of us to reach a place where we're willing to open our heart to the Lord and tear, let him tear down strongholds, these defensive positions, let him into our underbelly where we're weak and vulnerable and we're needy and we've protected ourselves, and to let him in there to heal us from the hurt of life because life hurts you. Life hurts. He says, love, John 13, 34, love one another as I have loved you. His love fills us and overflows to others. He gives us spiritual freedom 
that allows us to let go of our guilt, shame, and fear. But he says in Galatians 5.13, don't use your freedom to indulge your sin nature. Instead, use it to serve one another in love. Finally, agape is a mindset that is committed to the edification of others, regardless of conduct of the object or any kind of adverse circumstance. This is where, as far as ministry and relationship in ministry, where the Lord's trying to get us. We come into this thing full of self, full of self-interest, and that's normal. We're born into this life. Uh, if you will, go with me to Ephesians 2 right quick, and let me show you something. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Important passage. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. This is before you're saved. In which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, the spirit who is now working in the sons of disobedience. That's the unbelievers. Among them we too formerly lived in the desires of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature, by sin nature, children of wrath, even as the rest of the human race. So the point here is that because we're born into death, we initially come under the world system that is created and powered by the devil who hooks in and appeals to our desire and hooks us up with all the wrong things. And that's the way that we live up until the point we decide to become spiritual. You might even be saved. You got saved at five years old, but you didn't become spiritual until you were 22 or whatever. You lived your life up until 22 out of the world, dominated by the world, pursuing worldly goals, and then at 22, the Lord broke through in your life and you said, boy, I want more God. And this is when you begin to say no to this self system and yes to God, the God system. And as you do that, the ability to love other people, to give and edify other people grows. That's what causes it to grow as you grow spiritually. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love is patient, love is kind, it's not jealous, it does not brag, it's not arrogant, it doesn't act in an unbecoming manner, it does not seek its own uh, uh, benefit, it's not easily provoked, it doesn't count the wrongs suffered, that's a biggie. Listen, when you get when you start I talked last night about getting bitter, this is when you start counting and adding up the wrongs. How many times has your partner or your friend or whatever offended you, hurt you, rejected you, put you down, cut you, whatever? How many times? And you start adding this stuff up and using it as evidence against them and is justification for building your own walls or even separating or divorcing. I see it happen every day. Uh, so it does not keep an account. It doesn't add. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices, listen, when, when love sees someone operating for the purpose of unrighteousness or operating in, it's hurt. It's sad. But when it sees the truth in somebody's life, it rejoices. Isn't that true for you? Don't you rejoice when you, you know, the Apostle John said, it, it, I, I rejoice when I see my children walking in truth. If you see your children walking in truth, that would tickle you plumb to death. 
Absolutely. It rejoices with truth. It bears all things. It believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That's pretty powerful stuff here. Pretty powerful stuff. In closing, if you'll turn to Colossians 3, we're in Ephesians here. Just turn over a couple of pages to Colossians chapter 3. Losing my voice. It usually happens every year. Colossians 3, he starts off, therefore since, it's not if, it's since you've been raised with Christ, you're in union with Christ, continue seeking the things above where he is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not the things of the earth. So here we are, we're in Christ, we're saved, We've still got the ideas in the system of seeking the earth. But he says, look, stop seeking the earth and begin to seek and pursue and set your mind on the things of the Lord. It's a choice. Don't ever think it's not a choice. It's a choice. Then he goes on and explains how we're to lay aside the old and put on the new like we've talked many times. And then in verse 12, so those who have been chosen of the Lord, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just like the Lord forgave you, you should also forgive others. And beyond all these things, put on a agapa or agape, which is the complete bond of unity. Now look at that phrase, complete bond of unity. What in the world does that mean? I mean, what could that possibly mean? Well, the word bond is the word desmos, and it's a, it's a word that means a chain. It's like it's like the chains that Paul had around his wrist that chained him to the Roman soldier. It connected him and tied him to the Roman soldier. So this is the perfect bond of completeness for all of these virtues. What I believe this is, is that the mindset of agape which says, I'm going to do good to you and never do wrong. It takes these virtues and has them on the ready. And this is all Holy Spirit stuff. The Holy Spirit, when you're walking in the Spirit and you're listening to the Spirit and the situation comes up where you need these because you've committed yourself to edify and nothing else, whatever is needed in the moment, the Spirit brings to mind. If you need patience, boom, there it is. If you need forbearance, boom, there it is. And what love does, it, it, it sets you in that position where all you're going to do is edify. And when that happens, when you're in that posture, all the virtues of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, they're at the ready, and He, and he feeds you whatever you need in that moment. It ties them all together. That's what it means, the bond of love takes all the virtues and ties them all together and puts you in a posture to use these in the lives of other people. Agape love. This is what Jacob needed. We're in Ron's study on Joseph, and we're looking at the life of these, this family. And Jacob, listen, he made a huge mess out of this deal which is not that hard to do, but because he could not get to this place of maturity where he was willing to edify everyone equally, and he preferred Rachel and Joseph and Benjamin over everyone else, he's indulging himself <coughs> in his feelings and his desires and his romance and his, he's indulging that rather than Surrendering to the Lord to edify everyone equally, which is what our job is, 
and you see what a mess he made of it. And it took God through Joseph to bring this thing all back around. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a great privilege to be part of your family, your plan through faith in Christ. And we just pray that you give us wisdom and insight about these issues and that more than that, Father, you, you help us to make a commitment sitting right here right now to put ourselves in a position where we can learn and understand and believe your word that the true principles that we're being taught, the Spirit is bringing out of this book and communicating to us on a consistent basis. This is given freely. It's given at no charge. And it's all to build and develop us so that we can have the life that we dream of. We can be the edifying force for the Lord that we want to be and that we can please you, Father, and that we can... We can be the people that you designed us to be and, and be rewarded and live like this forever. We love you. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.